Dr. Sage here, back with our series of four video lectures discussing the prokaryotes. In this second video, we're going to discuss the major groups of prokaryotes. But first, some typical features of prokaryotic cell. Prokaryotes do not have any membrane-bound organelles, so they don't have a nucleus, for example. But they do have a chromosome, which is located in a region called the nucleoid. Okay, now they do have their own ribosomes inside the cell. They also have a cell membrane. And then outside the cell, they have a cell wall. They often have a uh, thick slimy coat called a capsule. They can have a flagella, this long tail here. And they can have pilus. Okay, and we'll discuss some of these structures as we go through the set of video lectures. Another thing to note about prokaryotes is they can come in different shapes. They fall into three basic categories of shapes. Okay, so one is cocci, which is spherical, as you can see here. Okay, this is one bacteria cell, this is another bacteria cell. Or they come in the shape bacilli, which is rod-shaped. You can see this rod-shaped bacteria here. So there's one here, and there's actually attached to another one here. Or they have spiralized shape, which is spiral shape. You can see that spiral shape right there. So what are the major groups of prokaryotes? Remember, there are two domains that prokaryotes fall inside, the archaea and the bacteria. Okay, so we have the archaea, and then we have the bacteria. Now the bacteria is made up of five bacterial phyla, the proteobacteria, which is further subdivided into five classes, alpha threpsilon, the chlamydias, the spirocytes, the photosynthetic bacteria like cyanobacteria, and the gram-positive bacteria. So let's quickly run through all these different categories. First is the archaea. Now the archaea share certain traits with bacteria. For example, they don't have a nuclear envelope, they don't have any membrane-bound organelles, they have circular chromosomes instead of linear chromosomes, and their ribosomes look like prokaryotic ribosomes, not eukaryotic ribosomes. But they do share some traits with eukaryotes. For example, they can have introns in some of their genes, whereas bacteria don't have introns. Uh, some species of archaea have histones, the proteins that wrap around the DNA, whereas bacteria don't have histones. And archaea have similar components, similar enzymes that are used for transcription and translation to eukaryotes as opposed to bacteria. Archaea also have unique traits because they're not bacteria or eukaryotes. Uh, more than half of their genes are unique. They do have a cell wall, but it has unique components. It's made out of different pieces in the cell wall of like plants and eukaryotes or the cell wall of bacteria. Uh, they have unusual membrane lipids. Some are hyperextremophiles, so live in environments that other organisms couldn't live in. And some are methanogens. They produce uh, methane anaerobically. Okay, so now let's get into the bacteria domain. First group we're gonna talk about is the proteobacteria, which is made up of five classes. The first, the alpha proteobacteria. Okay, the alpha proteobacteria, many species are closely associated with eukaryotic hosts. And something to note is that scientists hypothesize that mitochondria evolved from aerobic alpha proteobacteria through endosymbiosis. Next, we have the beta proteobacteria. An example of this is Soyobacteria nitrosomas which oxidize ammonia into nitrate. Next group is the gamma proteobacteria. Examples include the sulfobacteria, chromatium, and pathogens such as Legionella, Salmonella, and cholera. E. coli is also in this group, and it resides in the intestines of many mammals and is not normally pathogenic. So some things you've heard of before, like E. coli bacteria, Escherichia coli, is in this group. Other things you might have heard of because it does cause human disease, like salmonella, you might have heard of salmonella disease, or the bacteria that cause bubonic plague, or ones that can cause lung infections, ones that can cause cholera. Next class is the delta proteobacteria. These include the slime secreting myxobacteria, and then we have the epsilon proteobacteria, which contains many pathogens, including Campylobacter, which causes blood poisoning, and Helobacter pylori, which causes stomach ulcers. Okay, so that was the proteobacteria phyla. The next phyla is the chlamydias. These bacteria are parasites that live within animal cells. Chlamydia causes blindness and euthrus by sexual transmission. You might have heard of chlamydia as a sexually transmitted disease before. Next phyla is the spirocetes. 
Uh, these ones have a helical shape. Some of these are parasites, including the one that causes syphilis and the one that causes Lyme disease. Next phyla is the cyanobacteria. These are photoautotrophs that generate oxygen. So in other words, they can take in light energy to produce sugar molecules like glucose, and they also generate oxygen as a byproduct. Another thing to note about the cyanobacteria is that the chloroplasts in plants likely evolved from cyanobacteria by endosymbiosis. Next phyla is a gram-positive bacteria. Within this phyla, we have bacteria that is the cause of anthrax. We also have the bacteria that is the cause of botulism. Um, we also have bacteria that can be pathogenic, like Staphylococcus and Streptococcus. And we have the bacteria that are the smallest known cells to exist, the mycoplasms. So a lot of these human diseases you've heard of before, like you've heard about anthrax, you've heard about a staph infection or a strep infection, that's from these bacteria. And you might have heard of botulism before, which causes human disease and it's also used for people to inject into their faces because that's what Botox is, the toxin, the toxin from botulism. They inject in the faces, deadens the nerve cells, and gives them that younger looking facial expressions. So they're injecting themselves with poisons. Yay. Now, we have gram-positive bacteria and gram-negative bacteria. Generally, most species are divided into these two major groups. Both groups have a cell wall composed of peptidoglycan. In gram-positive bacteria, the wall is very thick, whereas in gram-negative bacteria, the wall is thin. So if we examine gram-positive bacteria, what we'll find is a very thick peptidoglycan layer here, okay, shown in red in this figure. In gram-negative bacteria, we find a much thinner peptidoglycan layer, still shown in red, but then outside of that, there's a second membrane, an outer membrane. Okay, that's a gram-negative bacteria. Peptidoglycan forms a rigid network. It helps to maintain the shape of the cell. It withstands hydroponic environments. And archaea have a similar molecule. Now this name, gram-positive or gram-negative, it comes from gram-staining, which is a procedure you do in the lab. Gram-positive bacteria have a thicker peptidoglycan wall and stain a purple color whereas gram-negative bacteria contain less peptidoglycan and do not retain the purple colored dye. They retain the counter stain and look pink. So let's say you're working in a lab and you have some cells. You want to know, are these cells gram-positive bacteria cells or gram-negative bacteria cells? So you take those cells and you go through this gram-staining procedure, which you begin by heat fixing the cells. Then you stain the cells with crystal violet dye, so the, will all the cells will all turn purple. Now that dye very nicely attaches to the peptidoglycan layer in the gram-positive cells. And also will stain in the gram-negative cells the outer membrane and the peptidoglycan smaller layer. You add iodine, then you wash the slide with alcohol. Now, when you wash the slide in the gram-positive cells, the crystal violet iodine complex is trapped within this peptidoglycan layer. Whereas in the gram-negative cells, the crystal violet iodine structure is washed out of this very thin peptidoglycan layer. So it, the gram-negative goes from the purple color to the clear color again. Then you add a counter stain, okay, which gives them this pink or reddish color if the gram-negative, because that then attaches to the peptidoglycan in outer membrane, whereas it can't in this one that is already stained purple, the gram-positive. So this is a simple laboratory procedure where you can determine what type of bacteria cell you're looking at. Is it gram-positive or gram-negative by going through the staining procedure? Now we also have structures outside of the cell wall, so you can have an S layer, which is a rigid paracrystalline layer found in some bacteria in archaea. It's outside of peptidoglycan or the outer membrane layers in gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. It has many diverse functions, including adhesion, helping the cells to stick to the structure they're attached to. You can also have a capsule, which is a gelatinous layer found in some bacteria. It again, it aids an attachment to the substrate that it's trying to attach to, and it can protect the bacteria from our immune system, where we're trying to fight off those bacterial infections. Bacteria also can have flagella, which is slender, rigid helical structures composed of the protein flagellin. It is involved in mo locomotion, allowing the bacteria to swim through the liquid it's living in, and it kind of spins like a propeller to allow it to swim. 
You can also have pili, which is short hair-like structures found in gram-negative bacteria. It aids in attachment of the cell to the structure it's attached to and in conjugation, which we're going to talk about conjugation in a later video. Some bacteria can also form endospores. So let's say a bacteria is exposed to an environmental stress. Okay, so not enough food for in the environment, lack of water in the environment, something like that. It will develop a thick wall around their genome and a small portion of the cytoplasm. Okay, you can see in this figure, like this is a bacteria cell right here. Okay, and the green inside it, that would be the endospore that's forming inside that cell. This allows them to survive extreme conditions. So you're highly resistant to environmental stress, especially heat. These cells are then metabolically inactive, so they stop their metabolism, but they're still viable, they're still living. But they stay dormant, sometimes for centuries. Okay, and then when conditions improve, they can then germinate and return back to normal cell division. Examples of bacteria can do this is ones that cause tetanus, botulism, and anthrax. Now, bacteria, some also have internal membranes. Now, remember, they don't have organelles. So they don't have membrane-bound organelles or compartments inside the cell. What happens is the plasma membrane of the cell can invaginate or fold in, okay, creating membranes inside the cell. And these membranes can be, then be used for metabolic functions like cellular respiration or photosynthesis. Bacteria also have a nucleoid, which is the region where you find their chromosome, and it can also contain plasmids. They also have ribosomes. The ribosomes in bacteria are smaller than those of eukaryotic ribosomes. They differ in the proteins and the rRNA that makes up the ribosomes. And because the bacterial ribosomes are different from our ribosomes, that's one of the things we can target with antibiotics to kill off bacteria cells without harming your eukaryotic cells. Now, prokaryotes have different types of metabolism. These fall into categories. So you have autotrophs, which get their carbon source from inorganic carbon dioxide, or heterotrophs, which get the carbon source from organic molecules, such as glucose or food, as an example. Then you have subcategories. In the autotrophs, you have photoautotrophs and chemoautotrophs. Photo refers to light, so they get their energy from the sun. Chemo refers to chemicals, so they get their energy from oxidizing inorganic substances. Then the heterotrophs also form into two categories, photoheterotrophs and chemoheterotrophs. Again, photo gets the energy from light, chemo gets the energy from organic molecules. So an example of a photoautotroph that you're familiar with, that would be a plant. They either get their energy from sunlight and their carbon from inorganic carbon dioxide. An example of a chemoheterotroph that you're familiar with is yourself. You get your carbon atoms and your energy from organic molecules, glucose. Okay, or maybe a nicer way to depict this is you have the photoautotrophs. Photo get the energy from light. Autotroph get the carbon from carbon dioxide or other inorganic compounds. Chemoautotroph, okay. Chemo gets the energy from a chemical, carbon from inorganic compounds. Photoheterotroph, photo gets the energy from light, heterotrophs gets the energy from organic compounds. Chemoheterotroph, chemo gets the energy from chemicals, heterotroph gets the energy from organic compounds. Now of note, although some organisms do photosynthesis, all known organisms do cellular respiration. So that's the second in the series of video lectures talking about the prokaryotes. In the third video lecture, we're going to learn about prokaryotic genetics. So until then, this has been Dr. Sage.